the way it is. So let me just get this clicked on here so I can advance my slides. Anyway, in uh, writing this book, I came across, uh, as you might imagine, many, many stories. And I just want to share a couple of those quickly to start off the talk tonight. Uh, the first one is about the great colonial hurricane of 1635, which slammed into Massachusetts in mid-August. Right before the hurricane arrived, there was a vessel called the Watch and Wait, which was leaving from Ipswich and heading to Marblehead, Massachusetts. On board were 23 people, including Anthony Thacker, or Thatcher, and his wife and four of his children, and also his co cousin, Joseph Avery who was slated to become Marblehead's new priest or pastor or minister. So they took off from Ipswich and right when they got to Cape Ann, part of Cape Ann, uh, the hurricane blew in and the uh, vessel crashed on an uninhabited island, right off of an uninhabited island. Everybody on board was killed except for Anthony Thatcher and his wife. They managed to make it to shore barely clothed, cold, and uh, they soon became quite hungry because they stayed there for five days before a vessel came by that they were able to flag down. That vessel took them to the mainland on Cape Ann and the Massachusetts legislature felt so horrible about the ordeal that Anthony Thatcher had lived through that they deeded him the island upon which he had crashed in perpetuity. And we know that island today as Thatcher's Island, which is part of Rockport, Massachusetts. Then there's a story from the Miami hurricane of 1926. Uh, just to the north of Miami was Fort Lauderdale. And there was a couple who was in their house when the hurricane struck. The house collapsed, pinning the husband under some rubble. The wife, however, was free. Uh, she didn't want to leave him as the water kept rising and she held his chin up to keep it out of the rising water and he begged her to leave and she wouldn't but finally as the water continued to rise she gave him a kiss said goodbye and left the house then there's this story from a hurricane that many of you no doubt are quite familiar with the great hurricane of 1938 which struck on september 21st of that year on that morning, there was a man at the tip of Long Island who had long been waiting for a barometer to come from Abercrombie and Fitch. And late that morning, on the 21st, a package arrived. He opened it up excitedly, he took out the barometer, and he quickly got quite annoyed because the needle on the barometer was pointing to a reading that was so low that it could only mean one of two things either a hurricane was already there or one was about to arrive. Yet when he looked outside, the Atlantic was calm and the sun was shining. So he quickly penned an angry letter to Abercrombie and Fitch, got in his car, went into town to mail it at the post office. He shouldn't have been so rash because by the time that he returned from town, both his house and his precious barometer had been wiped away or washed away by the great hurricane of 1938. Now, Furious Sky contains many more tragic stories like these, but the book is much more than a litany of death and destruction. It also weaves together a great, great range of captivating themes. There is the intriguing history of meteorology, the influence of hurricanes on the course of empire, the outcomes of war and the fortunes of in individuals adds to the story. Critical innovations in communication, aviation, computer and satellite technology play an important part, as does the women's movement and its role in the naming of hurricanes. In the end, the history of America's hurricanes forces us to confront the thorny question of how we can best adapt to the continued barrage of the greatest storms on earth, which we know will be coming. Hurricanes are an inevitable and painful part of the American experience. Just as we can count on the sun rising and setting each day, so too can we count on the periodic arrival of hurricanes on our shores. If you're among the many tens of millions of people living on the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, or in Hawaii, hurricanes are looming threats 
that might invade your life. The hurricane season officially runs from June 1st to November 30th. In an average year, six hurricanes dance over the Atlantic, three of which are major hurricanes, which have sustained winds of at least 111 miles per hour. Typically, two hurricanes make landfall in an average year, and only once every two years does a major hurricane strike. As many of you know who have been following the news about our hyperactive hurricane season is present, we've already exceeded the average. We've had eight hurricanes in the Atlantic, four of which have made landfall. And it looks like there might be a couple more just in the next week or two. Now, hurricanes are not equal opportunity offenders. While 21 coastal states, including ours, Massachusetts, have been hit by hurricanes, the residents of Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Louisiana, and South Carolina, in that order, take the brunt of the punishment, with Florida accounting for 40% of all hurricane strikes. Here in New England, we have a landfalling hurricane about once every decade, or about 10 per century. And although there's no way to predict the future, I am pretty convinced that in the next 10 or 20 years, we are going to have another hurricane on the order of the great hurricane of 1938. Our time is coming. Hurricanes have left an indelible mark on American history. Since 1980, they have accounted for roughly 50% of the cost of all natural disasters in the United States that have exceeded $1 billion in damage. And going back to the 1800s, hurricanes have killed at least 30,000 people. A Furious Sky is the history of hurricanes that have struck what is today the United States. But before going any further, a key term must be defined. What is a hurricane? Simply put, hurricanes are violent, swirling storms with sustained winds of at least 74 miles per hour. They generally form with the ocean's upper layer, layer down to a depth of 150 feet, reaches the trigger temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, thereby supplying the heat energy necessary to fuel the storm. Two other conditions necessary for hurricane formation are low vertical wind shear, which keeps the hurricanes from being ripped apart, and an abundance of warm, moist air that evaporates from the ocean's surface. When that moist air rises, it cools and condenses, forming clouds and releasing something called the latent heat of condensation, which powers the storm. Hurricanes can be anywhere from tens of miles in diameter to more than 1,000. They rotate in a counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern. They're characterized by extremely low pressure and a relatively calm center called the eye, with the most ferocious winds occurring in the eye wall. Now, many people have attempted to describe hurricanes through the centuries, and one of those was a young Alexander Hamilton who penned a letter about a hurricane that struck his home island of St. Croix in August of 1772. He said in part, good God, what horror and destruction. It seemed as if a total dissolution of nature was taking place. The roaring of the sea and wind, fiery meteors flying about in the air, the prodigious glare of almost perpetual lightning, the crash of the falling houses and the ear piercing shrieks of the distress were sufficient to strike astonishment into the angels. And that letter, was penned so brilliantly that local wealthy individuals on the island of St. Croix banded together and raised money to send the precocious Alexander Hamilton to New York City to continue his education at the university that is known today as Columbia. Now, hurricanes have had a significant impact on the course of American history. For example, there were two hurricanes that swept the Caribbean swept into the Caribbean in the summer of 1780. They destroyed numerous French and British warships, killed more than 20,000 people, including many, many military officials and Marines. Those hurricanes caused the French to reconsider the, the idea of staying in the Caribbean during hurricane season. So when the next hurricane season rolled through in 1781, the French decided to go north, both to escape 
hurricane season, but also to aid their allies, the American colonists in their battle against the British. By following this course of action, the French played a critical role in the Battle of the Chesapeake, Battle of the Chesapeake, and the ultimate victory of Americans, of the Americans over the British at the Battle of Yorktown, which ended when Lord Charles Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington on October 19, 1781. Of course, that was not the end of the war, but it was a major turning point. And not long thereafter, peace negotiations got into high gear. Now, of course, hurricanes didn't cease with the founding of our nation. And over the past 237 years, there have been hundreds of hurricanes that have pummeled America's shores, including the Great September Gale of 1815, which was just a hurricane by another name that plowed into New England. The hurricane seared itself into the memory of a young Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who was only seven years old at the time, and would become one of America's foremost essayists and poets. Holmes's 1836 poem, titled The September Gale, humorously recounted the impact of the hurricane on his wardrobe when it came over his house in Cambridge, Massachusetts. One of the stanzas re reads, it chanced to be our washing day and all our things were drying. The storm came roaring through the lines and set them all a-flying. I saw the shirts and petticoats go riding off like witches. I lost, ah, bitterly I wept. I lost my Sunday britches. The Galveston hurricane of 1900 leveled the city and killed at least 6,000 people and maybe as many as 10,000 and ranks as the deadliest natural disaster in American history. The Labor Day hurricane of 1935 ripped through three government work camps in, uh, located in the Florida Keys, killing hundreds of World War I veterans who were building a highway to Key West. It is still the most intense Category 5 hurricane ever to strike the United States, with maximum sustained winds of 185 miles per hour. Ernest Hemingway, shown here, who lived in Key West at the time, was one of the first responders to offer help to the stricken. After seeing the death and destruction on Lower Matacombe Key, Hemingway wrote to his agent, the brush was all brown as though autumn had come to these islands where there is no autumn, but that was because the leaves had all been blown away. The biggest bunch of dead were in the tangled, always green, but now brown mangroves. You found them everywhere. And in the sun, all of them were beginning to be too big for their blue jeans and jackets that they could never fill when they were on the bum and hungry. At one of the work camps, a doctor came upon a veteran named Elmer Kressberg, who had a two by four that went clear through his abdomen and out his back. Kressberg was still alive and amazingly calm given the circumstances. The doctor told him he wanted to pull the board out and was willing to give him morphine to dull the pain. Kressberg refused, telling the doctor that it didn't matter since he was going to die as soon as the wood was removed. What he really wanted was a last drink. So he asked for two beers, which were quickly provided. After finishing them, Kressberg said, now pull, the doctor did, and Cresper died. The Great Hurricane of 1938 delivered a body blow to New England, resulting in damages of 300 to $400 million and killing 680 people, making it the most destructive natural disaster ever to strike New England. And in writing this book, and since the book has come out, I have run across many people uh, who either lived through the hurricane, not so many who lived through it, but many that heard stories from their parents and grandparents. And no doubt some of you watching tonight have your own personal stories, how your family uh, managed to survive or maybe not survive the hurricane of 1938. The actress Katherine Hepburn was at her family's Victorian summer home at the edge of the water in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, when the hurricane struck. She and five other people in the house escaped 
as the house was being ripped apart and torn from its foundation. They sought refuge in a nearby inn that was on higher land. Uh, later on, Hepburn would recall that she looked back and she said, we saw the house slowly turn around, sail off to the northeast and start down the brook, which fed the swamp lagoon. It just sailed away, easy as pie. Later, she called her father in Hartford. When she told him that the house was gone, he responded, I suppose you didn't have brains enough to throw in a match before it disappeared. I'm insured for fire. Here's a picture that I just uh, ripped from the internet today. It's a uh, part of the BPL collection. This is obviously, as you can tell, a sailboat that has been sunk and uh, crashed into the rocks in Marblehead Harbor right after uh, the hurricane of 1938. Now, Hurricane Carol, which struck the eastern tip of Long Island and then plowed into the New England in late August of 1954, left 60 people dead and caused nearly $500 million in damage. The most iconic casualty of Hurricane Carol was the steeple of the Old North Church, which came tumbling to the ground. Hurricane Camille in August of 1969 clobbered coastal Mississippi. Of the many people who suffered during Camille, none had a greater burden to bear than Paul Williams Sr., who was the caretaker at Trinity Episcopal Church in Pass Christian, Mississippi. The night that Camille came ashore, Paul and his wife Myrtle and most of their children chose to stay and ride out the storm in the auditorium that was attached to the church. The hurricane demolished the auditorium, and in the end, 11 of Paul's children perished, along with one grandchild and his beloved wife, Myrtle. And I will point out that those of you who read about Hurricane Laura that barreled into Mississippi a couple of weeks ago, it hit basically the exact same area that Hurricane Camille had clobbered many decades ago. Hurricane Andrew struck Miami on August 24th, 1992. It tore off 30 mile wide swath of misery through Miami-Dade County. A staggering 126,000 homes were destroyed, leaving more than 160,000 people homeless overnight. Total damage approached $27 million. Now, Zoo Miami was especially hard hit. About 300 rare birds uh, were lost when the zoo's aviary was smashed. The staff at the zoo herded the Caribbean flamingos into a men's bathroom to shield them from the hurricane. Hurricanes rarely strike Hawaii, but there have been a few of note, the most memorable being Hurricane Aniki, which made landfall on the Hawaiian island of Kauai on September 11, 1992. It killed six people and cost $3.1 billion. It also forced director Steven Spielberg to cancel the final day of shooting for Jurassic Park. Everyone associated with the film crowded into the Westin Kauai Hotel to ride out the storm. The crew survived, and a few weeks later, Spielberg and a few of the actors went to Oahu to film the final scene, since all of the sets on Kauai had been destroyed. At the end of August 2005, Hurricane Katrina ravaged parts of Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana, costing $125 billion, making it the most expensive hurricane ever to strike the United States. It left about 1,800 people dead in Mississippi and Louisiana, with Louisiana claiming the lion's share. Ground zero for Katrina was the city of New Orleans, which suffered the most devastating blow. Multiple levee failures around New Orleans left 80% of the city submerged in water that was up to 10 feet deep. Tens of thousands of people were stranded in their homes, surrounded by a toxic brew of contaminants that one observer labeled hazmat gumbo. It took the better part of a week for a wide range of organizations and individuals to rescue or respond to the many thousands of people who were trapped in their homes, businesses, and hospitals. It wasn't until Monday, 
September 5th, that the Army Corps of Engineers finally closed all the breaches. And it wasn't until late October that the city was finally drained of all of its water. Seven years after Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy struck New Jersey and New York on Monday, October 29th, 2012. Its close proximity to Halloween gave it the name Frankenstorm or the Halloween horror. It killed more than 150 people and resulted in $65 billion worth of damage. Sandy's waves pounded the shore with such force that their vibrations were registered on seismographs 2,500 miles away in Seattle. New York City was particularly hard hit. Many subway lines and automobile tunnels were flooded. At one point, close to a million Con Edison customers in and around the city lost electricity. And here's another picture that I grabbed from the internet today showing the, uh, the walkway or the, the, the near Fort Sewell during Hurricane Sandy. And just think, Hurricane Sandy was enormous. It was only a category one storm when it struck, but it stretched uh, almost a thousand miles. Though even though we were very far from the landfall in New Jersey and New York, the waters really were kicked up up here. And the hits just kept on coming. The 2017 hurricane season turned out to be one for the record books. In the end, there were 10 hurricanes, six of which were major. Four of those hurricanes roared ashore. But what really set 2017 apart was that three out of the four hurricanes that made landfall were major ones. Each of those were category fours with winds of at least 130 miles per hour. Never before had there been three category fours that made landfall within a single year. The damage attributed to hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria totaled $265 billion, making 2017 far and away the most expensive hurricane season ever. Hurricane Harvey dumped more than 50 inches of rain on Houston, and it dumped 60.8 inches of rain on Nederland, Texas both of which are all-time records for a single storm. Hurricane Irma maintained winds of 185 miles per hour for an astonishing 35 hours over the open Atlantic, setting a world record for sustained wind speed. Irma's winds destroyed 50% of Florida's orange crop. Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico as a strong category four with winds of 155 miles per hour. And up to th it dumped up to three feet of water in some areas. Maria damaged or obliterated virtually every human made structure outside of San Juan, the capital, and many within the city's limits. And it knocked out power to the entire island, leaving 3.4 million people in the dark. The death toll for Maria has spawned considerable controversy with numbers ranging from about 1,400 to more than 4,600. Now, while Furious Sky details some of the most destructive hurricanes to reach our shores, it also recounts pivotal discoveries over the past three centuries in the fields of meteorology, aviation, and communications, which have greatly improved our ability to understand, monitor, and track hurricanes. For example, after studying a hurricane in 1743 that traveled from Philadelphia to Boston, Benjamin Franklin, our founding inventor, became the first person to realize that hurricanes have forward movement and that the winds in a hurricane can blow contrary to the direction in which the hurricane is moving. During the great storm controversy in the mid-1800s, arguments between amateur and professional meteorologists helped to develop the basic image of the hurricane that we have today, of a mass of swirling moisture-laden winds, the velocity of which greatly increases as one approaches the center of the storm until one enters the calm, clear, and surprisingly beautiful eye. The advent of the telegraph, then the radio, followed by hurricane hunter planes, which can literally fly into the heart of a hurricane and send out real-time data to meteorologists' uh, landside. 
and Earth orbiting satellites all contributed mightily to our ability to track hurricane, hurricanes from inception to dissolution. Such advances combined with vast improvements in computer based weather prediction models means that we have advanced warnings of a hurricane's strength and the timing of its arrival. But as you know, if you were watching the storm track of Hurricane Sally or Hurricane Laura, these uh, incredibly complex meteorological events cannot be forecast with perfect accuracy. And there are changes that take place right up until the moment it roars ashore. Now, there have also been dramatic changes in the way we identify hurricanes. In 1915, 1935, no, wow, 1953, I keep moving up in the century. The Weather Bureau, which is the precursor of the National Weather Service, began naming hurricanes after women. This decision angered many who thought that it was inappropriate to do that. One woman complained that she would much prefer that an unnamed hurricane hit her home rather than one named after one of her husband's former girlfriends. The Bureau, however, would not be swayed. It stuck fast to its naming system, making it permanent in 1956. Protests died down, that is, until Roxy Bolton spoke up. Roxy Bolton was a vice president of the National Organization of Women. In 1970, she urged the National Weather Service to stop naming hurricanes after women. She was tired of reading and hearing media accounts in which female named hurricanes were variously described as witches, capricious, furious, bad girls, unladylike, vicious, and treacherous. She said women are human beings and deeply resent being arbitrarily associated with disaster. Bolton offered some alternatives. Hurricanes, she thought, could be named after birds or perhaps after politicians who loved having things named after them. She even recommended that hurricanes be called hemicanes instead. The service refused to budge. Then during Jimmy Carter's presidency, he appointed Dr. Juanita Kreps, the first female to head the Department of Commerce. She was also an avowed feminist. She took up Roxy Bolton's cause, and in 1979, gender equality won out over tired bureaucracy. From that point forward, Hurricanes are named after males and females on an alternating basis. And again, if you've been following the news, you know that this has been an extremely active hurricane season with a great number of tropical storms and hurricanes. And we only have one more name left, Wilfred, which I think will be taken within the next couple of days. And after that, the next tropical storm or hurricane that comes about will be named after the Greek alphabet. This is only the second time in history that we've run out of 21 names and have had to go to the Greek alphabet. Now, meteorologists have not only been interested in forecasting hurricanes, but for a time, they wanted to control them. From the late 1940s to the early 1980s, there were various government experiments to study whether the seeding of hurricanes with dry ice or silver nitrate could weaken them. None of them succeeded. Since the mid to late 1900s, many other methods besides cloud seeding have been suggested for controlling and even eliminating hurricanes. Some of the most fanciful ideas include flying a fleet of enormous, a fleet of propeller driven planes in a, uh, around a hurricane in a clockwise direction to unwind the storm. Another idea is to tow icebergs from the Arctic down to the tropics to cool off the ocean and sap hurricanes of energy. And then there's the most popular suggestion of all, nuke them. Just drop a nuclear bomb into the center of a hurricane. And I have to tell you, whoops, ah, wait a second, hang on, we will get back. Here we go. Every once in a while, my computer gives me a, an error message, which I can't figure out where it comes from. But when it comes up while I'm giving a talk, that's what happens. But anyway, uh, you know that uh, nuking hur hurricanes has been in the news in the last couple of years. 
And uh, hurricanes are so massive, so powerful, that dropping one or even quite a few nuclear bombs into their center would do very little to alter their movement or strength. And then we'd have to deal with the horrific problem of nuclear fallout. Now the cycle continues. Every year a new hurricane season unfolds. No matter what an individual hurricane season brings, one thing is certain. The United States will continue to be pummeled by the greatest storms on earth. And because of global warming, hurricanes of the future will likely be worse than those of the past. Global warming has already made the impact of hurricanes worse because sea level has risen as a result of the thermal expansion of the oceans and the melting of glaciers, storm surges associated with hurricanes are higher and more destructive. Uh, these are waves crashing down in situ. A growing number of scientific studies have found strong evidence linking global warming to increased precipitation and stronger winds during hurricanes. Thus, under the warmer conditions that predictions say will be the norm towards the end of this century, it is likely that hurricanes will be stronger and wetter. There's also troubling research that shows that in a warmer world, hurricanes are likely to slow down. Therefore, they will linger longer. And you know what happens if that is the case? There'll be more rain that can fall in one area, and that area will be subject to many more hours of destructive winds. At this moment, nobody can say with absolute certainty exactly how hurricanes will change in a warmer world and as a result of global warming. Scientists would be the first to admit that there are still many unknowns, as well as limitations in data and modeling that make it exceedingly difficult to predict the impact of a warmer world on these massive storms. The mounting scientific consensus that an increase in global warming will likely make hurricanes of the, of the future worse, however, is not encouraging. And I have to point out, there was a very extensive study that came out just a couple of months ago, well after this book was put to bed, that for the first time showed a statistically significant increase in the uh, rainfall and the intensity of hurricanes in recent decades as a result of the warming world. Now you need more studies to show the same imprint but uh, it, uh, if I was a betting person and a policy person in a position of making decisions, I think it's pretty clear that we're in store for a future where we're gonna have more hurricanes probably, and they're going to be stronger and wetter. But even if global warming causes no difference at all in hurricane behavior, society still has to grapple with a hurricane-filled future. And as more people move to the coasts, the potential impact of hurricanes will only increase. As this book was heading into the final stage of production, Hurricane Dorian riveted the nation. Beginning in late August of 2019, Americans watched the round-the-clock coverage of this rapidly intensifying storm as it barreled across the Atlantic. Each day, reports became more alarming as Dorian not only grew into a massive Category 5 storm, but also appeared to be heading directly for the East Coast of the United States, but first in line were the Bahamas, parts of which were utterly destroyed by Dorian, which essentially stalled in place for almost two days. When it departed the Bahamas, it was a Category 2 hurricane. There were still grave concerns on the East Coast, and uh, the fear that the hurricane was next going to visit there prompted evacuations from Florida all the way to Virginia. Over the next few days, Hurricane Dorian hugged the coast. It briefly regained Category 3 status as it encountered warmer waters, uh, but it missed uh, Florida and the lower coast. Its only landfall in the United States was on Cape Hatteras, and it was just a glancing blow before Hurricane Dorian sailed off into the North Atlantic, next striking Nova Scotia, where 400,000 people were left in the dark. While Dorian's impact on the United States was significant, it was virtually nothing compared with what happened to the Bahamas and what might have happened if the hurricane had plowed head on into the American coast. Instead of skirting the mainland, clipping North Carolina, 
before heading off to Nova Scotia. This time, America was lucky. But if the history of US hurricanes tells us anything, it is that such luck will not last. And this is my last uh, slide. Uh, this is me in 1991 uh, after Hurricane Bob had slammed into the Cape. My wife, Jennifer, who was born in Marblehead or grew up in Marblehead, uh, she worked for the state of Massachusetts at the time on a tree planting program. And she had to go down to Falmouth to do some reconnaissance. So I came along and I am walking on the beach in Falmouth and that's a summer cottage that's been destroyed by the hurricane. And I do wanna mention that that Hawaiian shirt that I'm wearing was one of my favorite shirts at the time, but Jennifer uh, really didn't like it. So when we moved in together, I had to get rid of my Hawaiian shirt and also my suede vest, which had tassels on it. She didn't like that either. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. I'd be happy to answer questions. Let me do the stop share thing. So I get this off. There we go. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, I hope I didn't scare you about the future, but we're gonna get struck. In fact, the right now, if you've looked at the Weather Channel, uh, I think there are one, two, three, I think there are, I think there are five or six active uh, storms in the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast the majority of which are probably gonna turn into at least tropical storms. A few of them, I think, are gonna become hurricanes. Uh, so, uh, and I have to add one other thing since we're in Marblehead, uh, Colorado State University, which is one of the premier hurricane prediction centers in the world, uh, did an analysis and they said in a, in a normal year, uh, Massachusetts might expect to get, uh, there might be a 6% chance that a hurricane makes landfall in Massachusetts. But this year, because of all the increased activity, it's gone up to a 10% chance. Still remote, but we might have a wild time. That was great, thank you, Eric, so much. Uh, let's see, we got a hand up already. Lynn, feel free to unmute yourself. And yeah, I just did. So my question is, is there any scientific theory as to why Hurricanes do seem to strike in the same area all the time. I mean, like New Orleans is constantly getting it. And is it just because of the warmth of the water or? Well, well there, there's no theory that actually a lot of different parts of the coast, New Orleans, it seems like they've been hit a lot, but almost every part of the Texas coast, Louisiana and the Gulf Coast and the lower East Coast has been struck uh, once, twice or more than that. It really has to do with the steering currents that are in place at the time the storm rips up. I mean, the warmer water means that there are likely to be more storms that are forming. And the Gulf Coast and the Gulf of Mexico is extremely warm right now. Yeah. I mean, really warm. So is the East Coast. If you've gone swimming off Devereux this summer, you know that the water, it's just warmer than normal. Yeah, so you can actually swim. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's an environment that's conducive to hurricane formation. Uh, but yes, New Orleans seems to get struck quite a bit. And, and several other places, you know, like Charleston and, you know, right. just seems like they gravitate. Well, and of course, the Bahamas and the beautiful right. Virgin Islands. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, it's very uh, traumatic. Places we love to go, you know, Grand Cayman and all those great places. Ugh. Right. I, I had one of the best interviews I've had for this book. I was speaking to a former senator from the U.S. Virgin Islands on Virgin Islands NPR. And we had a great time, but he really gave some searing stories of his own, of him living through hurricanes that have crashed into uh, St. John and uh, St. Croix. And uh, it's just horrible. Yeah, it is. I've never lived through a hurricane. I have to be up front. I've lived through the remnants of Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Bob, but I've never lived through a landfall of a hurricane. So I don't have that searing experience, but I read so many accounts of people who did, I feel that vicariously I can get some kind of sense of the horror that yeah. it involves. It's devastation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Hi, um, I have a question. I'm just wondering if the increased uh, frequency of hurricanes has anything to do with the increased number of dry summers that we seem to be having up here. Uh, uh, 
I don't know if there's a connection between that, but I can say that the increased number of dry summers and drought in general has to do with global warming. There is a clear linkage that scientists have uh, determined between a warming world and the greater frequency of droughts and dry periods. So they all seem to be interconnected, but I don't know if anybody's done a study that looks just at drought in our part of the world and the frequency of hurricanes. But I think it's all part of the same tapestry we're weaving and it is of some uh, concern. Wildfires too. I mean, there are a lot of things that spring from uh, having a warmer, a warmer world. Mm -hmm. bad. The book's not all bad news. It's actually quite fun to read, so. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, it sounds like it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't want to say one thing, if there are no more questions, since this is a Marblehead group. Um, if any of you are interested in buying a copy of the book, I have copies in my house. I've sold a number to people in Marblehead and other places. I've been mailing them out. So if you go to my website, which is just my name, Eric J. Dolan, D-O-L-I-N dot com, there's a page that talks about buying a copy. You can reach, you can reach out to me through my website. And if you want a copy, I'll sign it and put it on my doorstep or deliver it to your house. Uh, oh, nice. I'm just putting that there as an option since this is a yeah. local, a local uh, yeah. crowd. And I do have one question. I can only see six people. I know that there are some of the 26, 28 people, but I, I, I've noticed something on my Zoom talks. I've given about 10 of them, I think. And I would say that 90%, or maybe 80% of all the people who I can see are women. I do see Herb there, so that's a man. So do you have any, I'm just curious, why is it that so many more women, is it the topic or is there something about, I, I just noticed in almost every Zoom talk I've given, it's been like 80% women, 20% men. Maybe it's because men don't read as much. I don't know. Eric, my husband loves your books. So. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but Eric, can I ask you a question? Oh, hi, <laughs> hi, yeah. hi, Eric. It's Julie Glass. Yes. Um, so this is kind of a complex question, and I hope I can phrase it in an articulate way. But, you know, when you look at how hard mm -hmm. states in the southeast part of this country are hit, yeah. um, why, in, in all your research, and I know you are like the most amazing researcher, what, <laughs> did you see any kind of, is there any kind of political coalition about what climate change has to do with hurricanes in terms of political activism? It, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, get political here, but one of the things that amazes me when I read about how the hurricanes strike you know, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, you know, Georgia, is why is there no prominent climate change political activism? Oh, no, 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 no. There, there, is, a, there is a huge amount of political activism. Okay. So around, can you talk about that? Climate change, I mean, multiple okay. environmental groups, millions of people are very active. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there isn't a lot of political activism. I think what you're driving at is uh, climate change, global warming has become incredibly polarizing, yes. incredibly, unfortunately, partisan, which it shouldn't be. And there are many people who just refuse to believe any of the science. It's fine to question the science, but there are people that you know call climate change a hoax. And I'll give you a quick story. I wrote a book called Brilliant Beacons, which is about lighthouses. Great book. I mentioned, thanks. <laughs> I mentioned in that book in one sentence out of a 440 page book, I had one sentence about global warming. I said that a number of lighthouses have had to be moved away from the coast like Cape Hatteras because the oceans are rising. And that is a clear result of a warmer world. And I don't think there's any scientist that disagrees with that statement that I just made, that the world has gotten warmer and it's caused sea level to rise. So, I had one sentence where I said, because of global warming and its impact on the sea level rise, there are likely to be other lighthouses that are very close to the shore that are gonna to have to be moved back. I got two emails from two different people that basically, I won't say what they said, but they were very nasty. And one guy said to me, the nice thing that he said, is your book was great until I got to that crap that you said you spouted about global warming. And that was one sentence in a book. 
So I don't want to get into a political discussion about it right now, but I will tell you there are millions and millions of people who feel very strongly about climate change, climate change activism. Uh, and in fact, polls show that the majority of Americans believe the global warming is real, but it's become such a highly charged uh, 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 subject that I think even people who live along the Gulf Coast and in Florida who sustain the brunt of hurricane damage, and given that hurricanes are one of the things that we think are being affected by global climate change, many of the politicians down there refuse to acknowledge that climate change or global warming has anything to do with it. And that's fine if they want to. I think it's a misguided approach. And I think that history will show us what the truth is over time. So, so does your book address climate change? Oh yeah, the whole, the whole epilogue in the, of the book is about global warming. And uh, I will tell you, I haven't gotten one piece of hate mail. I got a lot of hate. I got, I've gotten hate mail for a couple of my books for things that I said, which I didn't, I, I didn't, well, when I wrote my book on whaling, I got a number of nasty emails in my fur trade book from animal rights activists telling me that I was glorifying uh, uh, abuse of animals. Anyway. <laughs> Peter? It's a strange world. There are a lot of people that have very strong opinions. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Peter, do you have a question? I, I, well, I, I question and a statement. Um, okay. it's, ev it's evident to me that the, the daily newscast uh, hype weather and it helps, helps their ratings. Mm -hmm. yep. You can certainly see that when there's potential snowstorm coming to Massachusetts and everyone's got their guys out in the parkers and talk, sort of, you know, measuring the snow that hadn't come yet and so forth and so on. Do you think because of the hyping of hurricanes, and, and I don't want to say hyping it applies, but because certainly they are severe, but due to the hyping of weather that in many cases when a hurricane is predicted to hit wherever, Louisiana, that the people, because of hyping of weather in the past, believe it's not going to hit them or because of false alarms in the past and they stay too long and, they can, and then they can't uh, leave the scene or can't, uh, uh, move out of the way, and, and that leads to some of the destruction of, and, and certainly uh, deaths that they have uh, occurred yeah. recently. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I talk about that extensively in the book. It was a concern even back in the 1950s when the TV age, the golden age of TV sort of took off and they had to decide how to report on weather events. Uh, there's a fine line between giving people good active information that can be downright scary and overblowing the information and pumping it up I think in some instances, as you say, uh, for ratings purposes or just to get carried away with themselves. Uh, I, I don't know where to draw the line. It's a very uh, specific thing. I think most meteorologists are very professional about it, but it's inevitable. You can't avoid it because forecasting a hurricane is not an exact science. There's always gonna be variation. So there are always going to be examples where they say a hurricane is gonna be this category and is gonna strike this area and then it goes down a category or two and it strikes another area. So people don't believe the forecast as much. That happened with Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy came a couple of years after Hurricane Irene. Hurricane Irene had been predicted to do a major number on New York City. I mean, flood the subways, really destroy a lot of New York City. It wasn't as bad as it had been predicted. And, and there are people who I quote in the book who basically said, hey, Irene wasn't as bad as they said it was going to be, so Sandy's not going to be as bad as they say it's going to be. So that's an inevitable problem that we'll never be able to get away from. And there are inevitably large numbers of people who refuse to take uh, into account orders for evacuation, and they just hang out. There are people who have hurricane parties who laugh in the face of death. And what they don't realize is by staying in a dangerous area, they're not only imperiling their lives, but also the lives of all the first responders and the other people who might have to be called upon to save them once their house starts to fall apart. So it's a very tricky uh, thing to, to do properly, to figure out the, the right line. But I, as an individual, would always err on the side of caution and responsibility. And I wouldn't get upset at my local politicians or my local meteorologists for uh, telling me to evacuate and then later the hurricane maybe hit a different area and it wasn't as bad. I have no problem with that. But people are very unforgiving 
I mean, they don't realize how amazing it is, the weather forecasts that we have today and how phenomenal the job our meteorologists do. Uh, when they're right all the time, okay, that's just status quo. When they make one mistake, they're pilloried. And there's something about human nature that's very disturbing in that manner. Um, I think it'd be great if we all talk, took more personal responsibility and took seriously the threats that are conveyed to us. Uh, so if a hurricane hits Marblehead, I know that you're going to leave <laughs> when they tell you to evacuate. And that's a very nice painting behind you, by the way. It reminds me a little of a farm in Vermont or something. But anyway. <laughs> I can't hear you. You must be on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, I don't. I want just one brief thing now that, and, and you just sort of touched on it. And that is, there are the thrill seekers out there, uh, yep. the people who chase t tornadoes, the people who uh, uh, go out in the hurricanes. And I think we see a little bit today that the uh, the younger generation that decides to have parties during the, during the virus uh, pandemic, pandemic uh, right. and so forth. So you can't do away that either. But uh, but I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on on the comments about the, taking them seriously. But thank you very much. Sure, you're welcome. Thanks. I mean, you remember what? Um, was a couple of years ago when a nor'easter blew in and destroyed part of the landing? The restaurant that was just a nor'easter i mean nor'easters are sort of cold weather hurricanes nor'easters can be just as bad as a hurricane the perfect storm it's just uh, officially hurricanes are warm core events nor'easters are cold core and uh but a nor'easter can uh, cause great destruction and we're very familiar with that uh i'm not wishing for any hurricanes a lot of people ask me are you happy that we have an active hurricane season will it sell more copies of your book one i have no idea if there's a correlation uh Maybe people are thinking about hurricanes, but I never wish a hurricane on anyone. Uh, but unfortunately, the season we're having this year, I just think it's gonna become more common in the future. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, looks like somebody. I, I don't have a question, but one thing that oh. <laughs> I have lived in Marblehead during all the hurricanes you mentioned since 1944, um, and I don't know if you were in Marblehead then, and I don't recall with Hurricane Carol or Hurricane Donner or which one, but yeah. Tinker's Island we used to be a solid island like Cat Island or Tolan's Island and so forth. And Tinker's Island was basically cut in half by uh, the hurricane, either Carol, Carol or Donner. So now if you look wow. at Tinker's Island, you'll see that there are two, there's a sand, like a sand dune in the middle in, in the two parts of the island. Okay. Huh, fascinating. Yeah. That was done by a hurricane. Wow. Okay, I'm signing off. Okay. <laughs> Amy, did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, no, I was just curious. Um, I'm really excited to read your book, but what's the most surprising thing that you learned during your, while doing your research for this book? The most surprising thing is probably, you know, everybody knows that hurricanes have a major impact on a local community or a region where the hurricane hits. The most surprising thing was learning the number of instances in which a particular hurricane affected the course of American history. I'll give you another example. In, uh, the six, in the 1550s and the 1560s, there were two hurricanes that hit Florida. One of them in the 1550s hit Pensacola right when the Spanish were trying to colonize. It destroyed most of their fleet, ruined all of their food, and basically caused the infant colony to collapse. Just think how history would have been different if Spain had established a real strong foothold in Pensacola in 1559, and then it started spreading out through North America. Then just six, out, six years later, France and Spain were battling over the east coast of Florida, and they both had enormous fleets, military fleets, on the coast. And France was about ready to attack the Spaniards they had their whole fleet offshore of St. Augustine, and they were going to attack the Spaniards who were onshore. At that very moment, a hurricane came by, destroyed the entire French fleet, killed 200 French soldiers. The other 200 were hunted down by the Spaniards, and most of them were slaughtered, beheaded, after they surrendered and had their hands tied behind their back. But the net 
result of that is that Spain gained control of Florida. And they had control of Florida until 1763 and the French and Indian War. Now just imagine if France had gained control of Florida in 1565, the entire history of North America might have been dramatically different. They might have come up from the South and down from the North in Canada, and there might not even be a United States. I mean, so that, that's just, uh, that's the stuff that just was really exciting to me because history can really turn on singular events. So anyway, that's it. <laughs> Any last questions? Uh, oh. I don't think so. Well, no? oh, hey. well thanks. <laughs> thank you. It's always a pleasure, Eric, to have you. So excited to read the book. And so your website, oh, the Murrays have a question? Oh, go ahead. Oh, they're okay. waiting. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so they can go to your website to get your yes. book. That's correct. This is my name, Eric J. Dolan, spelled out with an I. Also, if you go there, you can look or read before you leap because I have. The, uh, the introductory chapter to A Furious Sky is on the website. So you can read it and decide if you want to buy the book. And if you don't buy it from me, that's fine. Buy it from somebody. Just buy it so I can keep writing. <laughs> oh, I, absolutely. Um, and I just want, before we let you go real quick, I want to let you know our, lex, our next lecture is Thursday, October 1st at 7, again via Zoom. And it's... Uh, Professor Joseph Edelman about his book, Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing the News, Leading Up to and During the Revolutionary War. So that's going to be interesting. I hope you can join us. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Eric. Wonderful as always. Appreciate it. Okay. Take care. Bye -bye. Night, everybody. <laughs>